Okay, um, I'm going to go over fungi today, chapter 32. As you can see, there's a lot of uh, sections in this chapter, but some of the sections are really, really, really short. So we're going to talk about what defines a fungi in this first section. Let's talk about some unique characteristics that distinguish fungi from other eukaryotes, compare mitosis in fungi and animals, and then why fungi may be useful for bioremediation. So first off, mycologists are people that study fungi, and they believe that there's probably 1.5 million fungal species in the world. Um, you find fungi anywhere. They're very important to life in terms of symbiotic relationships. In fact, without fungi, plants may not have colonized land. Um, they also serve the role of decomposers in a lot of biogeochemical cycles, um, but then they can also cause disease. So we'll talk about the benefits and um, the harmful effects of fungi. They are extremely diverse, and recent phylogenetic analysis of DNA and protein sequences indicates that they're probably more closely related to animals than plants. Um, so we'll talk about some features there, why we believe that they're more closely related to plants than, um, or sorry, to animals than plants. And then traditionally, your book um, kind of hymns and haws about how we group fungi. In the old edition, it was about how it reproduces, um, but it's still debated. Um, table 32.1 on page 620 in your book, which I think I'm actually going to show you on the next slide. But traditionally, there was four groups, but then in 2007, they agreed to seven different phylas. And now our book is only going to have like uh, between five and six. Well, the Phylogenetic tree shows six, or, and there's six sections, um, but the table down below only has five groups. So here's what I mean by this phylogenetic tree. And um, they have the five groups. So the chytrid mycota, and you can see that the chytrid mycota is boxed in with the neocalymastic, oh my god, neocalymastigomycota, as well as the blastocleido. Mycota. Um, and so they're actually going to take these two organisms and put them underneath the umbrella of the chytrids. We have the zygomycota, okay, right here. And you'll notice that it is a dashed line. And that's because the zygomycota, um, they're not monophyletic. Every other group, phyla, is monophyletic except the zygomycota. Um, and then the glomeromycota, right here, ascomycota, the sac fungi. Basidiomycota, the club fungi. Um, so yeah, those, those are the five groups, but then they, you know, have seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, never mind. Seven here, eight microsporangia. So um, they're they're basically named for the reproductive structures. The microsporidia are basically animal parasites, and they're actually debatable as to whether or not it's a protist or a fungi. And then in the learned objectives, they actually say, you know, we're going to call it a protist, not a fungi, yet they include it in a fungi chapter, so go figure. Um, and then we have the um, blastocladiomycota, those are your water molds, okay? Um, the zygomycota produce zygotes. Chytrids have this flagella that is aquatic. Um, oops, over here. And these guys just have multiple flagella. And then we have the glomeromycota. They are asexual plant symbionts. So help probably helped plants colonize. Um, the basidiomycota are the club fungi. And then the ascomycota is the sac fungi. All right, some common characteristics. Number one, they're heterotrophs. And they absorb nutrients. So they don't make their own food like plants. They actually absorb nutrients. They have to get it from somewhere else, hence the heterotrophs. Now, the unique thing about these heterotrophs is that they actually secrete digestive enzymes into their substrates, and then they absorb it back up. So they actually live in their food uh, to get their nutrients. They have a number of different cell types. They could be unicellular or filamentous. And if it's filamentous, then they have these filaments made of strings called hyphae. And hyphae is extremely unique to this organism. It's uh, continuous branch and tubes filled with cytoplasm as well as multiple nuclei. So you can see that it's just a string of cells. Now, if you zoom in, you notice that this, this cell and this cell, they're not completely closed off from each other. There's a tiny little opening called a pore, and these are the walls, the septums, but they don't completely fuse together. So they have um, these long chains of cells joined end to end, divided by cell walls called septa, except there's a tiny little pore um, through that. So the septa's rarely ever completed as a barrier, except during reproductive reproduction. Um, and we'll talk about some of those um, types of fungi. And so um, my, basically what you get is when you have a mass of hyphae, 
and they're all connected, then you have something called mycelia. Okay. Now these pores, okay, in the hyphae slash mycelium, they're large enough to allow ribosomes, mitochondria, nuclei to flow from cell to cell. And as a result, hyphae can grow very, very rapidly. Cytoplasm flows freely throughout the hyphae, passing from, uh, from one cell to the other through the septa. And as a result, nutrients can be made or obtained by any part of the hyphae and can be carried to those actively growing tips. So this might be the reason, actually, this is the reason why you may look out your, your, your lawn one day and the next day you may notice mushrooms appear in your lawn overnight. Uh, so these fungal hyphae can grow very rapidly. Okay. Um, do I want to say anything else? Uh, I guess these, these structures, you know, they, they can live in the ground or in their uh, substrates, their food, um, and they can be huge. Okay. Um, I remember when I was your age, taken in a biology class, my teacher was talking about how back in 2000, they discovered mycelium of a giant individual fungus in Oregon, and it was 3.4 miles in diameter. So that's just crazy to think about. Okay, so here are some more um, diagrams kind of talking about how fungi are heterotrophs and they absorb nutrients. They do something called external digestion where they secrete the digestive enzymes so there's the secretion of digestive enzymes they work and degrade on the substrate and then they get reabsorbed by the hyphae and um fungi you know they they can break down many things they can break down cellulose in wood lignin in the cell walls of wood and almost any carbon containing compound like even jet fuel um, so this is where this interest of bioremediation comes into play because they are so useful in breaking down substances in this case jet fuel that you know could be harmful um, breaking it down into less harmful um, substances okay um, so yes there's that uh, this is a diagram showing how some fungi are actually active predators. Okay, they can snare and trap and even fire, fire um, projectiles kind of like into nematodes, which are worms here. So this hyphae is adapted for trapping and kill and prey. Um, other organisms that could be preyed upon by fungi, rot rotifers. Um, you guys saw that in your pond, virtual pond lab, and even small animals. So. Okay, some more unique characteristics of fungi. Cell walls made of chitin. It's the same material that makes up exoskeletons of orthropods. It's one of the shared traits in being more closely related to animals than plants because plants have cell walls, but it's made up of cellulose. Um, fungi may have more than one nucleus, and so I'm going to throw out a lot of vocab terms to make sure you know these for your exam. Monokaryotic means that you have a hyphae with only one nucleus. Some can have two nucleuses. So we call it a dikaryotic okay, cell with two nuclei, um, basically two haploid nuclei that exist independently inside of it. Um, sub kind of note underneath dikaryotic, the nuclei can be the same or they can be different. So if the nuclei come from two genetically distinct individuals or two genetically distinct hyphae and they're you know, together in one cell, then we call it heterokaryotic. But if they are genetically similar to one another, then we call it homokaryotic. Uh, mitosis, okay? Mitosis is not followed by cell division inside the hypha. Oh. Um, what this means is that the nuclear envelope never breaks down. Like in mitosis, it breaks down and then the cytoplasm or the chromosomes move with it with throughout the cytoplasm. Here, mitosis occurs with inside the nucleus. So the nuclear envelope never breaks down and reforms. Um, the spindle apparatus forms from within there are no centrioles in fungi. Instead, those microtubules that help divide the chromosomes is called spindle plaque. Hey, I'm working. Uh, what do you need? Uh, you got animal crackers for me? I don't have animal crackers, but in the side pouch, I have um, a chocolate cookie. A chocolate cookie? Yeah, if you go get my backpack, I'll show it to you. Okay. okay. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so due to the length nature of the cells, because these hyphae are not separated from each other, um, the, the cell itself is not a relevant unit of reproduction. The nucleus is. Okay, so it's, 
that's again a big difference. So this diagram is showing um, monokaryotic, which is representing these dots as the same nuclei. Dikaryon, we have two nuclei, but then underneath it, if they're all the same, then we have homokaryotic. And if they are different, denoted by these black and white dots, then they are heterokaryotic. Mm -hmm. Want me to open it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm working. I'm making a video. Yeah. For my students, because I'm a teacher. All right. They can also reproduce sexually and asexually. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about how they reproduce. There's lots of different ways they reproduce, but they usually use spores, and the spores can be asexual or sexual. And then um, when a fungus does reproduce sexually, two haploid hyphae of com compatible maiden types come together and fuse. Spores can be produced asexually or sexually, and most are dispersed by wind. So then when that spore lands in a suitable place, they germinate, giving rise to uh, a new fungal mycelium. Okay, so we'll, ha we'll talk about a dikaryon stage where we have two haploid cells that results in a diploid cell. Um, so animals, plants, and some fungi. Other fungi like the basidiomycetes and ascomycetes, the club fungi and the sac fungi, they have a dikaryotic stage where they don't fuse. So we call it 1n plus 1n. And then it will fuse right before, for a brief period of time to form a diploid nucleus. Um, and then we'll talk about some specialized reproductive structures. As you can see here, the sac fungi, you can see why it's called a sac because the ascospores um, are stored in a sac-like structure. And the basidiomycota, which is the clump fu fungi, looks like a club and the spores are attached at the end. The zygomycota, um, notice that it's called zygote fungi. Uh, they form a zygote structure right here. And then um, chytrids, I, I believe the chytrids, um, it means tails, but I, I'll have to double check that. But spores are the most common means of reproduction. All right, some review questions. Which of the following is an important component of cell walls and fungi? The answer is C, chitin. What characteristics distinguish fungi from other eukaryotes? That would be all of them. They have cell walls, um, they reproduce, okay. Food acquisition is different. Mitotic division is different. How do fungi relate the formation of microtubules during mitosis? That would be D, spindle plaques. In multicellular fungi, mitosis usually involves only the division of what part of the organism? That would be A, only the nuclei of its cells. Most fungi are capable of breaking down the blank that strengthens the cell walls of their food source. Be very careful about this one. Think about which one's tougher. And it is B, lignin, okay? Which of the following is not a characteristic of a fungus? That would be C, the ability to conduct photosynthesis. One more slide, I know lots of review questions. A fungal cell that contains two genetically different nuclei would be classified as that would be D, heterokaryotic. And finally, where does a fungus perform digestion of its food? That would be B, externally through excretion of enzymes. Moving on to microsporidia, unicellular parasites. So talk about one slide, basically, characteristics that led them to be classified as protist, and then evidence that places microsporidians with uh, the fungi. So these guys are obligate, unicellular parasites of animals. Okay, um, obligate means that they, they need their host, okay? Um, they do not possess a mitochondria, so they are anaerobic. One distinct feature about the microsporidia is this structure called the polar tube, which allows them to invade host cells. So if you take a look at figure 32.6 in your book, or even on the slide here, it says through an explosive mechanism, the germinating spore discharges. So you can see it's coiled up. And then when it's ready to penetrate into the host cell, it kind of uncoils and um, uh, gets through that cell membrane or whatever animal it is, or organism, and the contents of the spore, including the cytoplasm, and the nucleus travel through and enter the host cell. Okay, another thing about um, microsporidians, and it's probably why they are classified as fungi, is they have spores that are highly resistant to stressors. Okay, so they can survive for several years. Uh, I guess I should talk types of animals that they infect. I almost forgot to say this. Um, insects, crustaceans, and fish. There are some vertebrates that can also be affected by it. 
they can cause diseases in humans. They can be um, a lot of immunosuppressed patients might be affected by a microsporidia or those that have just recently gotten a new organ or an organ transplant. All right, that does it for microsporidia. Moving on to chytrid, chytridiomycota and its relatives. So you can see we're moving on in the family tree here. Um, so these two are kind of underneath the umbrella of the chytrids. So we'll distinguish between blastocladiomycetes and microsporidians, explain the meaning of chytrid, and discuss possible uses of these neocalamastigomycetes. All right, some common characteristics of chytrids. Um, they are aquatic, they have, a, they have a flagella, and they are closely related to ancestral fungi. These guys are probably... Um, like ancient, like they probably formed first. Only chytrids have flagella. That's the trait that must have been lost among the ancestors of modern groups. Um, because they are aquatic, it's likely that this fungi first appeared in water, as did plants and animals. Um, they also produce the production of zoospores, flagellated asexual spores. And you can see that right here in this um, uh, life cycle. And chytrid means little pot. Okay, so it's not a little tail, it's a little pot, the structure that releases the zoo pores, zoo spores. You can see that's the um, little pot structure that releases the zoo spores. Another thing about chytrids is that um, they may have a symbiotic relationship. Well, they do. there are symbiotic relationships, and we'll, you'll see that on the next couple slides. But they also may be contributing to the worldwide decline in amphibians, and I think I talked about that in the last section of fungi. So the blastocladiomycota, um, one unique thing about them is that they exhibit an alternation of generations, which we discussed with plants. And so they have uniflagellated zoospores. You can see them right here. Um, one species of blastocladiomycota is the Alleomyces. Um, they have a giant mitochondria and a haploid diplonic uh, life cycle. And that's this diagram right here. And this reproduction is actually enhanced by pheromones, okay? The pheromones are hormones um, th that are usually associated with uh, reproduction or warning other organisms about danger or trying to lure um, a mate in, but it's released by female gametes, and they call this pheromone siren, siren in. Um, so it's basically the first fungal sex hormone to be identified chemically, which is kind of cool, uh, interesting anyways. So here's this haploid gamete, um, and they will fertilize forming a sporophyte to a young sporophyte to a mature sporophyte. You can see it's diploid. Um, and then in the sporangium, it will undergo meiosis. Um, there's the little pot that releases those haploid zoospores to the gametophyte. And here's our young gametophyte. And the process kind of um, repeats itself. Notice that they can do asexual reproduction. Moving on to the neocalamus mastigo mycota. Uh, these guys form the sim symbiotic relationship that I mentioned. So they can digest cellulose in ruminant herbivores. So they actually live in animals, okay, in their gut. Um, so because of their ability to digest cellulose and lign lignin, they are useful in herbivores in their grassy diets. So animals depend on them to obtain sufficient calories. Um, and then, as I said, like we can use it for bioremediation, maybe even the, the production of biofuels. These guys are anaerobic fungi, um, and that makes sense because in your stomach you don't really have oxygen, so um, little little oxygen there. They have reduced mitochondria because of that, because if you have a mitochondria, that means you need oxygen. Well, these guys don't, so that's reduced, and um, these mitochondria actually lack the structure cristae inside of them. Their zoospores have multiple flagella. In fact, the name Neocala mastigo, that part right there, a mastic means whips, and so you can see that there are tiny little flagellas, whips, um, extended from the zoospore. Review question. Based on physical characteristics, the blank represent the most ancient phylum of fungi. D. Chytridiomycota. The life cycle of Alleomyces has both multicellular diploids and haploid stages. What is this type of life cycle called? That would be B. Alternation of generations. Final review question, which fungi live with, within the rumen of mammalian herbivores and enzymatically digest cellulose and lignin? That would be C. Neocalamastigiomycetes. Hey, hey, I think I said that pretty good. Moving on to zygomycota, fungi that produce zygotes. So we'll talk about this distinguishing feature that sets zy zygomycota apart from the other um, groups of fungi and then the advantage of that zygospore formation. Now remember, notice that the, it's a dashed line because they are not monophyletic, okay? 
of the zygomycota. That's about a little over a thousand species, incredibly diverse. When I think of zygo zygomycota, I think of bread molds. Um, strawberries, you know, when they get moldy, that's zygomycota. And then there are a few ha human pathogens, um, but yeah. All right, so the sexual reproduction produces this specialized structure called um, the zygosporangia. Oh, I thought that had it on here. No, oh, okay, well, maybe else we'll talk about that. But basically they produce a, zy a diploid zygote. That makes sense, because zygotes, egg and sperm meat, right? So the zygo, yes, honey? I want chocolate heart. Bring me the, bring me the basket. Okay. Okay. Sorry. All right. The zygomycetes lack septa in their hyphae, except when they form in the sporangia, which is the spores, or the gametangia, which is the gametes. Um, so sporangia, spores, usually asexual reproduction turns into that gametophyte, if you will. Asexual reproduction is common with the zygomycetes. It occurs way more frequently than sexual reproduction. Um, and so if that happens, then we have stocks called the sporangial fours. And then the sporangial forms form the sporangia and they're separated by septa. So let's just take a look at the life cycle here. Okay, I'm going to talk a lot here. So looking at number one, notice that we have two different hyphae they meet. And you can see that during this process called plasmogamy. Okay, um, plasmogamy is just the fusion of two hyphal cells. And it's going to produce a dikaryotic cell. And you can see that in the purple color here. Okay, and then the two nuclei are going to fuse. And when they fuse, um, we basically have sexual reproduction occurring. So sexual reproduction begins with the fusion of this gametangia, um, which, which forms when those two hyphae meet. Okay. Now the fusion of that is called karyogamy. Okay. Fusion of those haploid nuclei is called karyogamy. And the area where it takes place is called the zygosporangium. And this is where the zygospore develops. Larissa, give me the basket. Something tells me you ate some. Sorry, my daughter is trying to get chocolate from me. One. Okay. Ah. Okay, you go back out. I gotta finish this. All right. So, the zygosporangium, and this is where our zygospores are going to form. A little while later, but not right away. I mean, if conditions are not favorable for growth, it will just wait it out until conditions are right. But the nuclei will undergo meiosis and it will produce haploid spores. Okay, so you can see that here. Uh, so what's going to happen is the zygosporangium is going to germinate and release those haploid spores. And then, um, then they can land on the ground and do their thing, become a haploid individual, and then they can fuse with others. Now, these guys are capable of asexual reproduction, which occurs way more frequently than sexual reproduction. I think I've said that. But the hyphae produce clumps of these erect stocks called sporangial fours. Okay, so sporangial fours form sporangia and they are separated by the septa. So that is kind of like unique for this asexual reproduction, sporangial fours. All right, moving on to the review question. Which of the following groups of fungi is not monophyletic? A. Zygomycota. Mycota. In the culture of hyphae of unknown origin, you notice that the hyphae lack septa and that the fungi reproduce sexually by using clumps of erect stalks. However, at times of sexual reproduction can be observed. To what group of fungi would you assign it? D. Zygomycota. I know, I know. Terrible review questions at the end of this section. Moving on. Select a feature of zygomycetes. It would be D. They lack septa except when they form the sporangia or the gametangia. In the life cycle of zygomycetes, where might you find diploid cells? That would be A, within the zygosporangium. The sporangia 4 is um, for that haploid individual. Okay, moving on to the glomeromycota. So why they are now considered separate from zygomycotia, because at one point they kind of were underneath that umbrella, and then provide evidence um, for their colonization of land, of land, plants, plants on land. Okay, so these guys are basically asexual plant symbionts. It's a very tiny group of fungi, about 230 species, which probably helped plants colonize land. The hyphae are also non-septate, and sexual reproduction has not been documented. So we're just going to call them asexual until we do observe sexual reproduction. 
Now the tips of the hyphae of this fungi actually grow within the plant root cells, and then they form a branch and structure that allows for nutrient gas exchange. So we actually call um, these glomeromycetes our muscular mycorrhizae fungi, or AMF for short. These guys cannot survive without their host plant, and the relationship is mutualistic. They both benefit from each other. Um, so they provide essential minerals to the plants, and the plants provide them with sugars and carbs in return. They were grouped with my zygomycetes because they lacked septa, um, but when we compare the DNA sequences specifically of our RNA, it suggests that they're actually in their own separate group. So here's a diagram showing the fungal hyphae um, and how it kind of penetrates through the plant root cell. Um, so it just kind of digs in. It helps give the plants like nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, um, other minerals like amino acids, and the plants in return give them carbohydrates. Okay, so it's a mutualistic relationship here. Okay, review questions. The early evolution of terrestrial plants was made possible by mycorrhizae relationships with the B, glomerulomycota. How, does it, how was it demonstrated that glomerulomycetes are a monophyletic clade that is phylogenetically distinct from zygomycetes? That would be C, comparisons of DNA sequences of small subunit rRNAs. Moving on to the club fungi, basidiomycota. So we'll talk about life cycle of basidiomycete and how it's diploid and then talk about primary and secondary mycelium. So we're getting to the end here. So bicidial mycetes produce sexual spores on the basidia. Uh, they're named for their club-shaped basidium, as you can see here, and it's their sexual reproductive structure, okay? Now, another thing about basidial mycetes, when you think of fungi, you're probably thinking of pictures like this, okay? So this is by far the most familiar fungi. So when, you know, people draw mushrooms or, you know, think of mushrooms, they're, th they're actually thinking about bicidiomycetes. So some mushrooms that are included in this before I get too far with the technical details, um, you know, we, mushrooms that are food based, okay, we can eat them, most, some of them, um, mushrooms that are hallucinogenic, okay, as well as deadly and poisonous, toadstools, puffballs, um, jelly fungi, shelf fungi, these are shelf fungi, okay, plant pathogens like rust and smuts, and I think I'll talk about that in the, this section here. So going back to the club-shaped basidium for their sexual reproductive structure. So karyogamy occurs within the basidium, giving rise to the only diploid cell of the life cycle. And then what happens is that me meiosis occurs immediately after karyogamy, producing these four haploid basidial spores. All right, so after the spores are released, um, germination occurs and produces a monokaryotic hyphae. This is called the primary mycelium. So it's monokaryotic hyphae, primary mycelium. Uh, eventually it might come in contact with a different maiden type and they use plus and minus to show different maiden types. And when they fuse, they form a dikaryotic mycelium and this is called the secondary mycelium. Okay, so remember um, if it has, if the nuclei are different, then we call it heterokaryotic in the dikaryon stage. Okay, I was just gonna see something here. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. So basidial carps um, are, or mushrooms, are formed entirely of their secondary mycelium. So the parts that you see above ground are actually secondary mycelium or in that dikaryotic stage. And I'm going to talk, I'm going to show you the structure of the gills because they actually have these structures called the gills and this is where the spores are produced and that's where you'd find the basidia. So here's the life cycle of um, Abyssidia here. This is my last slide for the section. So I guess we'll start with, let's just start with this part right here. So here we have two different maiden types, okay? And before they were just primary mycelium, okay? And so they meet and now we're gonna have um, two nuclei in a cell, plasmogamy, the fusion of hyphae cells into a dikaryotic mycelium. Okay, so it's kind of like our secondary 
um, mycelium. Now this is all going to happen in, um, well, anyways, with the secondary mycelium, we form this structure above the ground called the basidial carp. It's still N plus N. But if we zoom in on the gills, which is on the other side of this mushroom, um, you'll see the basidia, and there's still N plus N. And when they fuse, this is the only diploid stage. The jet is not on the TV. Okay, I'll fix it in a minute, okay? Actually, here. What? Thank you. Okay. Sorry. So this is the only part where they are diploid and they're going to immediately go through meiosis. So this diploid nuclei will go through meiosis and produce four haploid nuclei. Okay, and they, basically those are the basidiospores and then they will be dispersed and germinate and the process will repeat itself. Okay, review questions. Examine the life cycle of a typical basidiomycete and determine where you would expect to find a dikaryotic cell. So dikaryotic two nuclei, that would be the secondary mycelium B. Moving on to the sac fungi, ascomycota. So I'm going to compare the ascomycota uh, to the basidiomycota. They're actually very similar, except their sexual um, reproductive structures a little bit different. And then list ways that ascomycetes affect humans. Now, ascomycetes include some maybe more familiar economically important fungi, like bread yeast, pretty important in making bread, common molds, Morels, cup, uh, cup fungi, right here. My daughter's gonna come bother me any minute now. Truffles, okay. Truffles, um, they're extremely expensive. Um, they can also include many serious plant pathogens like blight, Dutch elm disease. It also includes penicillin producing ascomycetes. So some benefits there. Hold on. Larissa, come here. Let me fix the volume. I know. I know. It's loud. Okay, thank you. All right, so asexual occurs within the ascus, which is the sac. It looks like a sac. Uh, so it's named for its reproductive sac like structure called the ascus. And karyogamy, okay, produces the only diploid nucleus of the ascomycete life cycle. So very similar to Basidia, um, except that there's sexual reproductive structures in a sac, okay? Um, so yeah, the ascospores are produced in sacs. Basidial spores are produced on stalks that look like clubs. So here's a comparison picture between the ascus and the basidium. You can see that the ascospores are held within a sac. And here with the basidial spores, they're on top of the club. Okay. Um, so let's just start with the two different maiden types, right? So the two different maiden types, the plus and the minus, uh, they will meet and fuse in plasmal gamete, and now we have a dikaryotic stage, and it will form the structure that you see above the ground. And if we zoom in on the ascocarp, which is where we're going to find our, our SC with the ascospores on the inside, you can see that it's still dikaryotic. But when they fuse, um, then we have a diploid cell that will immediately undergo meiosis and perf uh, produce four haploid um, ascospores. Okay, so these ascospores are held within the sac. The sac is called the ascus, and then the ascospores will be released, and then they'll germinate, and the process will repeat itself. Okay, I like I like this diagram, um, but I also, because because I, I like this diagram because of the dikaryotic and the diploid and the haploid, but I like this diagram because it talks about the asexual reproduction part, which I do need to mention because this is on your exam. So um, these guys do have the ability to do sexual reproduction, as you can see here. Um, here's the sac fungi. There's the uh, C holding the ascospores, and they can be dispersed, okay? Um but it can do asexual reproduction, and it does it in a little bit in a different way. Instead of occurring in the SC and the ascocarp, um, if it reproduces asexually, it happens in a structure called the conidophore. Okay, so the conidophores are part of sac fungi, ascomycota, um, but it's only used during asexual reproduction. So then the spores that are released, we don't call them ascospores, we actually call them conidia. Okay, so I just wanted to make that aware but yeah 
there is a difference. So asexual reproduction occurs within the conidophores. So here the asexual spores called conidia are cut off by septa at the ends of the modified hyphae called conidophores. And uh, one benefit of asexual reproduction is that it allows for rapid colonization. If a, if a new for food source is in their environment, they can utilize it very quickly. It's a beautiful picture of this conidophore with the conidia being go about to be released. Some ascomycetes have yeast morphology. Um, so most yeast are single cell and then they reproduce asexually through fission or budding, um, usually budding. So the ability of yeast to ferment, ferment carbs, you know, break down glucose, produce alcohol and carbon dioxide. It's pretty fundamental in the production of bread, um, wine, beer, as well as other alcoholic beverages, spirits, I guess. Um, maybe you've heard of sourdough bread. It's actually a very, very unique culture of an ascomycete. Okay. But sometimes two yeast cells can fuse, forming a cell with two nuclei that can function as the ascus with karyogamy followed by meiosis. And then as a result, you just end up with two new yeast cells, but they usually reproduce through budding. Review question. Select the kind of fungi that does not belong to the phylum ascomycota. That would be B, the death cap mushrooms. All right, getting to the end here, ecology of fungi. Identify a trait that contributes to the value of fungi in symbiotic relationships. Describe the living components of a lichen and then some more fungal associations with different organisms. So first off, fungi play a huge role as decomposers. Okay, they are the principal decomposer in our biosphere along with bacteria, but you know, Fungi play a huge role in that. They break down these organic materials, return substances locked in those molecules, so that way those elements can be circulated in the ecosystem, and then they can break down cellulose and lignin. Fungi also have a range of symbiosis. They can be obligate symbiosis, which means that it's essential for their survival, like the microsporidians that I mentioned earlier, or the facultative symbiosis, which means they can survive without a host. Um, but just to recap, some of the three different types of symbiosis, parasite slash pathogen, that means the fungi would benefit and the organism would be harmed. Commensalism, the fungi would benefit, the organism is neither harmed nor benefits from it. And the mutualistic is where both um, organisms do benefit. Now pathogens and parasites gain their resources from their host, but they can have a negative effect that could lead to death. And so the difference between a pathogen and a parasite is that pathogens cause disease, but parasites do not. Endophytes are fungi that live inside plants and may actually protect plants from parasites. So they live in intercellular spaces, and this could be an example of parasitism or commensalism, depending on what it does and what it produces. Um, but there's growing evidence that fungi do protect hosts by producing toxins or deterrents. So they did this experiment where it says endophytic fungi can protect their hosts from herbivory. Um, Prediction: There will be fewer aphids, which is these tiny these bugs here. Um, aphids infected with the endophytic fungi than on unaffected ryegrass. So they placed five aphids on each pot for a two-week old grass pot, and the result was that there were significantly more aphids found on the unaffected grass pot where it did not have the endophytes. And so you can see that the aphid population increased, whereas here the one that actually the fungus in the plant or in the root system helped um, aided in the reduction of aphids. Okay. Lichens are another example of symbiosis between different kingdoms. A fungus and some type of photosynthetic host could be a plant, um, could be a bacteria. So what is a, a lichen? Um, it is, uh, like I said, a symbiosis between a fungus. In this case, the ascomycetes are usually the typical fungi partners, the visible body that you see when you look at lichen. Um, and then between cyanobacteria, green algae, so maybe a protist, and sometimes both. So what happens is that our fu the fungal hyphae penetrate and, or envelope, kind of like make a little cradle that holds the photosynthetic cell walls. It never penetrates the plasma membrane. I just want to make that clear. It never penetrates the plasma membrane of the, the host. Um, and then it transfers nutrients directly to the fungal partner. They do usually communicate through biochemical signals. And then it says fungi and lichens are unable to grow normally without their photosynthetic partners. If you take away the photosynthetic partners, they just don't grow the way that they should. And then also the fungi protect partners from strong light as well as from drying out. 
So this is what lichen looks like. Okay, and here you can see the ascocarp of the fungus, how it weaves and holds its photosynthetic host, in this case an algae cell. Um, yeah, just kind of holds it there. The ecology of lichens, um, because of its construction, it can live in some of the harshest climates in the world, especially up north. They are often the first colonists, basically the first organism that comes in to break down rocks to form soils. So if you remember primary succession and secondary succession, well, this is primary succe succession, uh, volcano erupts, and you're left with magma that cools or lava that cools, and you're, all you got is bare rock. Well, then lichens will come in and they'll break down that rock to form soils, and then you get other plants to colonate, and then which brings bigger animals. Um, lichens are colored due to the presence of the pigments that protect their photosynthetic partners, and you can see the wide range of colors here. And they are also very sensitive to pollutants, um, basically very good bioindicators of air quality, as this picture represents. So here you can see that these species are nitrogen sensitive, these guys are in between, and these guys can tolerate high levels of of nitrogen. I threw up here a picture of Scotland's famous Harris tweed because the same pigments that can be extracted from lichen are actually used as natural dyes. All right, mycorrhizae are fungi associated with roots of plants. So I've already mentioned mycorrhizae before, but 90% of known species of vascular plants involve some type of mutualistic symbiotic relationship with fungi. In this case, it's called mycorrhizae. Um, so again, it's an extension of the plant's root system. It helps increase the amount of soil contact, increase the total surface area for absorption, what the fungus gives to the plant, phosphorus, zinc, copper, mineral nutrients, and the plant in return gives them organic carbon. There are two types of mycorrhizae, arbuscular mycorrhizae, the AMF, which is most common in glomerulomycetes. So in this case, the hyphae will penetrate the outer walls of the plant root, forming coils, swellings, and minute branches. So there's our, um, our buscular mycorrhizae here. And then the ectomycorrhizae surround, but they do not penetrate the cell walls of the roots. Okay, So we find these as forced trees, um, basidiomyces, and as well some ascomyces. We can also have mutualistic relationships with animals, like the ruminant animals I mentioned earlier, grazers, um, they host fungi in, uh, in the guts. And then another unique symbiosis, the tripartite um, symbiosis between ants, plants, and fungi. So particularly with ants, in this case, leafcutter ants, they have an obligate symbiosis with a specific fungi. Okay, so that means they, they need them in order to survive. Um, and they have domesticated this fungi and maintained it in an underground garden. And so the ants provide the fungi with leaves to eat and then protect it from pathogens and predators. And in, in return, the fungi are actually the ants' food source. So I do have a short video that I'm going to have to sh link. Um, please watch it. It's, it's actually a really cool video. I just know that YouTube is probably going to trim it out if I do show it right now. So relation or sorry review questions symbiotic relationships occur between the fungi and d all choices are correct appraise the fungal relationship between a forest tree and a basidiomycete and determine the most suitable suitable classification for the symbiosis that would be c ectomycorrhizae choose which of the following best reflects the symbiotic relationships between animals and fungi That would be D, exchange of nutrients. What do some endophytic fungi produce that is protective of their host plants? Ooh, I'm not sure if I mentioned this. I think I, was, I made a mental note to say alkaloids, A. True or false, some fungi can break down jet fuel. That is a true. Final section, fungal parasites and pathogens. Um, so review pathogenic effects of fungi and the targets they may affect. And explain why treating fungal disease in animals is particularly difficult. So some fungal pathogens include like green mold on this grapefruit that you can see in panel A. This powder, powdery mildew on a flower. It looks like this is in here. Um, stem rust on a sheath of barley and gray rot on grapes. 
So fungal infestation can harm plants and those who eat them. It costs billions of dollars in loss in agriculture every year. Um, the spoiled food products can be harvested and stored, and they can also secrete sus substances into the food that make them unpalatable. So like, yuck, don't want to eat it. Carcinogenic as well as poisonous. Going back to this carcinogenic, I decided to look up a little bit more about that. They produce a toxin called aflatoxin that can grow in corn, peanuts, and cotton seed, and it can damage kidneys and the nervous system of animals. They can also cause harm to animals that consume them. Another example, vomitoxin, which is brain damage in humans. Uh, my husband talks a lot about vomitoxin during the harvest because Farmers, you know, when you bring in your grain, sometimes they can have high levels of omatoxin, and so there's a certain threshold that um, that the elevator will take, and if it's too high, then it's basically ruined. You can't, we can't take it, or they can't take it, and then if it's you know underneath the threshold, then they will take it. So. So fungi can harm humans and other animals. Some common diseases of fungi, ringworm, athlete's foot, nail fungus. Some more serious diseases are thrush and yeast infections. I don't know. Okay. And then um, it's also really hard to treat these diseases because fungi are eukaryotic. Um, so one type of drug or chemical that we use targets a sterile on the fungal cell called ergo sterile. Animals have cholesterol. So that's one difference between animal eukary animals and fungi because they're both eukaryotic. So we have to find differences to help treat them. And so that's what um, fungicide works on. Last thing I want to talk about is a case study that deals with chytrid, chytridiomycosis, or the chytrids. So um, back in 1998, chytrids were kind of first identified as this emergent infectious disease, particularly in amphibians. Amphibian populations have been declining for over three decades. It's, it is a trend. And so they've actually correlated the presence of this chytrid called um, batro, Batrochochytrium dendrobatrium or BD for short, um, encased in the skin. And so it's correlated with this, this chytrid. So they think this chytrid is causing amphibian population decline. It's been identified in frog carcasses. And um, also uh, on these carcasses, we see flask-like structures encased in the skin, which is associated with the spore production of BD. We've also have DNA sequence data that uh, supports it. So like when I first did this case study back at Gustavus when I was in college, um, they weren't exactly sure what was causing it. I mean, they kind of had an idea that maybe it was a fungi, but they didn't have the particular species or whatnot. Um, and so now it's, it's kind of like nice to know that, yes, they have confirmed that it is BD. It's probably the leading cause of the population decline. So bathe in frogs. If we capture frogs that have the fungus, you know, we can halt the disease by bathing them in some type of antifungal drug. Um, what BD does is that it affects the sodium and potassium transport channels across the skin. And as a result, it's going to alter the electrolyte balance. And it leads to um, cardiac arrest in these frogs, which is just sad. So here is, let's just talk about, okay, so BD is a chytrid. It's a, got a flagellated zoospore, which means associated with aquatic ecosystems and amphibians, they spend some of their life in the water. And so they'll, you know, be in the water and then they get infected by um, these zoospores. And you can see that it's like getting into the skin and then mortality is about two weeks. So it takes two weeks um, for it to kind of cause the damage and, and kill the frog and, um, then the cap can be lost and the zoospores escape through the skin and the cycle repeats itself. All right, review question. The difference between pathogens and parasites is that blank can cause disease and blank rarely do. That would be C, pathogens cause disease and parasites rarely do. Which statement concerning fungal spores is not correct? Um... Oh God, is it D? Spores are dispersed by wind, insects, and small animals. Spores are usually dispersed by wind. So it is D. So I think it's D. Pretty sure it's D. Okay. So um, that does it for chapter 32, fungus. Um, really sorry about the disruptions for my daughter. So, yeah.